This episode of the Julian Dion Comedy Hour Podcast, episode number eight. Yeah, eight episodes. We're doing it. It's brought to you once again by Echo One Photography. Hey, Toronto, if you're a comedian or musician or business guy or woman, person, need some headshots, Echo One Photography will do that for you. If you own a business and looking for some product photography for e-commerce or advertising purposes, Echo One will do that too. Yeah, contact Eugene today. Email Eugene, E-U-G-E-N-E at Echo1Photography.com. Eugene is here in front of me right now. Say hey. Hey. <laughs> Say hey, Toronto. Hey, Toronto. Say hey, hey, Toronto. Hey, hey, Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> Contact Eugene today. Message to my mom. Message to my mom. Hi, mom. This is episode number eight. Ocho. Wit. That's right. Three languages, one episode. Anyway, you haven't listened so far, and, uh, you know, that's, it's, that's all right. Okay? That's good. So, if you are just randomly... Starting now with the latest episode, just please let me start again by saying I love you very much. You're the best mom ever, but please don't listen to the podcast. Please turn it off. I say this with great love and respect. You might not like what you hear, so just um, do me that solid and uh, change the channel. I know you can't change the channel. It's a podcast, but just just turn it off. I love you. Message to my mom Message to my Welcome to the Julian Dion Comedy Hour Podcast. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Like I said, episode eight. Right? Yeah. What's happening? What's happening with you? Thanks again for tuning in and downloading. What are you up to? You're just hanging out? You vegging? You just smoke a big bowl? What are you you doing? Don't be so lazy and email me, pod at jdcomedyhour.com. Got some good emails, actually, which I'll get into in a little bit. Oh, man, alive. Yes. It's, uh, what what do we got? Oh, great show today. I'm going to keep the monologue short because we went long on the interview. Jen Grant, whom you know and love. My girlfriend, Jen Grant, is my guest today. Established successful comedian, and she's got a great story, and we talk about that, so I won't keep you too long off the top here, but uh, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Oh, God. It's good. I'm in a good mood. It's Tuesday. My beard smells of uh, milk that's turning. Milk product that's turning. You know that funky milk warm room temperature milk that smells almost of yogurt but not quite that's my that's my face smells right now i just got pied a belated six day late pied for my birthday see i'm the king of pieing people that's when you take 
a little bit of parchment paper, and you load it up with some whipped cream, and you just drive it into the face of the person that you love that is celebrating a birthday. And um, everyone's been threatening to get me. No one has. So I thought I was, I had escaped one more year. Anyway, I was at some friends having some Mexican, real, I mean real Mexican, authentic, the lady cooking barely spoke English, amazing food, and I got pied. So I figured, uh, uh, you know, may as well skip the shower and come straight to the studio, and I regret that now because my face now smells like my Nutribullet does. Like decaying food. It's been a celebratory week. Celebrations. My birthday. And of course, Thanksgiving. Canadian Thanksgiving. Happy Thanks Diggity. I didn't, I didn't really celebrate. I was busy the whole weekend. I never... And it's like long weekends. Everything of, like revolves around a long weekend. Like leading up to it and the days after. Oh, how was your long weekend? What did you do for the long weekend? How was your uh, Thanksgiving? Well, I didn't do anything. Really? I mean, I did so much that I didn't do anything re-Thanksgiving. Do you know what I mean? Like, I didn't... Uh, so I just plowed through my weekend, buried in work, never noticed it come and go. And time flies when you do that, when you sort of skip certain holidays. It felt weird to not have a full turkey dinner Thanksgiving thing, but I guess I sort of... We sort of did that last weekend with uh, my parents in Ottawa, so... We did it early, so this week I just, uh, yeah, did my thing, my my thing, and uh, but some like some people celebrate too like some okay Thanksgiving's one that you can celebrate, but some things maybe are not worth celebrating that much as a grown ass person. This is what I'm saying. Someone asked me yesterday on October thirteenth what I'm doing. Ask me seriously. Hey, what are you doing for Halloween? I don't know. I'm not... I'm more than 11 years old, so I don't know. Uh, who celebrates... Really, who... Ce unless you're, a, you know, a kid going to do... Going to... Going... going <clears throat> holy shit. Unless you're a kid <laughs> going trick-or-treating. Maybe I'll edit that out. Maybe I won't. That was weird. Stutter. Unless you're a kid or you're like 19, 20 going out in the bars dressing out like a dressing like a slutty cat or like a slutty nun or like a slutty um, homeless person, a slutty nurse, slutty teacher, school teacher, that's one slutty, you know, cow, cowgirl, uh, slutty cow, just a cow's outfit, but with uh, your boobs hanging out. Anyway. Uh, who celebrates Halloween? I and mean, who plans for it two weeks in advance? I didn't even know how to answer this person. What are you doing for Halloween? I don't know. Um, n what do you say to that? Would it have been weird if as a, as a grown-ass man I had a full, elaborate answer for this person? Oh, I've got this great costume. Um, I'm going as uh, Cher in drag, which would just be Cher... Uh, as a man, so I'm just going to put on a black wig. Uh, anyway, I'm losing myself in this monologue. Let I can't imagine you're still with me. Are you still with me? Anyway, don't celebrate Halloween so much. Take it easy. I'm that guy. I'm that guy now. I'm the curmudgeon. You kids in your, you kids in your Halloween celebrations, tone it down over there. I'll be the. I'll be in my house with the lights off. Don't fucking come to my. Get off my yard! That's me now. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean, right? It's uh, anyway. Email me what what your Halloween plans are. Pod at jdcomedyhour.com. But I do miss the family when uh, spe specifically on weekends like Thanksgiving, if I'm not around, and if I'm just, you know, you blast through the weekend, buried in work, and then you're like, oh, you know, my family's doing a whole thing together. They're on the East Coast, and everyone's there and local. And it's nice. It's nice to get together like that. And, uh, you know, because I go home about twice a year, and it's great. And uh, I have uh, a lot of nieces and ne nine nieces and nephews going on 10. 
And, you know, we could stand to learn a thing or two from kids. Uh, they teach us these lessons. Like, uh, okay, I'll tell you a story. I was back home over the summer, and my sister Sophie has a pool. And so we're all over there and uh, go in the pool. And after, I decide to shower. So I'm in her bathroom, and she's got, like, a glass stand-in shower sort of thing. So it's, like, just clear glass and a shower. And I'm in the bathroom, and I in there, I'm in the shower, and I have a towel, luckily, draped over the draped over the glass so and all anyway all of a sudden i see this uh, the door open slowly and i'm like oh shit some someone's in here and it's my little niece jenny who's adorable she's 3 going on 4 in november i believe yes anyway she's the cutest thing ever and she walks in and she i say i'm here and normally an adult would be like oh god i'm so sorry and turn around and leave she comes in, she's like, oh, that's okay, I just need to use the bathroom. And so I quickly, you know, wrap the towel around my waist. And I'm like, uh, yeah, okay, sure. Come on in. Lock the door behind you. No, don't lock the door behind you. Don't leave the door open. Leave it wide open. Anyway, so, and then she, instead of going right to the bathroom, she just starts talking to her uncle. Me, that's me. Third person. And so, uh, she starts talking, and so I, just to keep myself occupied, I guess, I don't know. Because again, as an adult, you're self-conscious, right? You're just standing there, you don't know. But the kid isn't self-conscious, it's just purity. She's just seeing my uncle. Her uncle. What if I was in there with my uncle? It was me and my uncle. It was weird. And then she came in. Anyway, so she's just pure. And she's looking at me. And she's making conversation. So I start squeegeeing the glass from inside the shower. I'm encased in this, you know, glass container of shame. And I'm doing the thing, uh, wiping it down. And she compliments my squeegeeing technique. She, oh, you're very good at that. So you're really good at squeegeeing it. At my house, even if you squeegee, it doesn't do a good job like you're doing. It's because they have like frosted, my other sister has like frosted sort of um, glass. Anyway, tempered glass. And so we're talking, I'm like, oh, that's nice. And then she decides to go pee and she sits on the toilet. Again, no self-consciousness. There's nothing, there's no, why would it be weird? Just, just her and her uncle, she's hanging out. She goes to the bathroom, and then she reaches for the toilet paper. She just does a quick, like a, like a two-second tinkle. Like pees for like literally 1,001, 1,002. That's probably even long. Like as adults, we're gross. We pee for like 40 seconds of just toxic waste. <laughs> Anyway, she's just pure, two-second tinkle, one second, two seconds, and then she goes to wipe, and as she's reaching for the toilet paper, she, uh, she's like, oh, she has this thought of like, uh, I don't want to wipe. She realizes she's, if she wipes, she has to clean her hands, and that's too much work. She needs to get back to the pool, do kid things. So she's like, I don't want to, I don't want to dirty my hands. Can you wipe? So what do you do? You know, of course... It's pure innocence. It's just pure. It comes from a place of love. So I'm just sure. And I'm not used to being around kids. This is the, this is what makes the whole thing funny. It's I'm really not used to being around kids that much. And so I'm all uncomfortable. I just take toilet paper and go dab one little dab. That was it. Is this weird? Is this a weird story? I just thought I wanted to share that with you. It was very cute, I thought. Just very innocent. And this is what I think we can learn from kids. Just like, why do we always have to go to weird places in our head when it comes to things like that? Why do, uh, automatically, we just go to the worst possible things? When it all, it's just a nice little moment. I feel like you're getting weirded out by this. Don't, don't, don't be fucking weird. Let's do some emails. Hello. You have 6,056 new messages. You Aren't you fucking popular? You oh, they are all from stalkers. 
All right, like I said off the top, we've got a good amount of emails this week. So thank you for email, pod, P-O-D, at jdcomedyhour.com. And uh, also a lot of people have been asking about other segments. Baby Jeffrey is coming back. We're recording a bunch of these. Uh, I've got a couple brand new segments coming up for you. Um, some more new, flash news flash. We're going to give that another go. Uh, so tune in on Friday for some of that little action. And uh, Friday I've got uh, guest uh, Darren Frost, comedian, uh, very successful comic. Okay, let's do this. Emails. Here we go. First email. Hey, Julian. My name is Rick from Grand Berchois. Hey, Rick. My This is in New Brunswick. My shake exploded in my bullet. I'm guessing he means Nutribullet. My shake exploded in my bullet the other. Sealed or something on the up. Beeped up. My shake exploded in my bullet the other. Sealed or something on the up. Beeped up. My shake exploded in the bullet, the other, comma, sealed. It's not even just a comma. It's the other space comma. There's just a comma in the middle there. You know what I mean? Like a space. Okay. Am I reading this wrong? My name is Rick from Grand Berchois. Got that. Okay, I get it. He's Rick. He's from Grand Berchois. My shake exploded in my bullet, the other, sealed something on the up, beeped up. Rick, like I understand each word individually, like shake and bullet and other, sealed, but collectively the way they're strung together, I don't fucking understand a thing this says. Okay, let's try it again off the top. My name is Rick from Grand Berchois. Maybe if I change my cadence. My shake exploded in my bullet the other, sealed something on the up, beeped up. No, still nothing. I'm guessing is is shake exploded... (laughs) Okay, anyway, motor pretty much cooked my delicious shake as it seeped through the bottom. He bottom, actually, not the bottom. Anyways, chucked it in the sink and passed through water. Still works, but every time I press down to blend, I have anxiety that I will get electrocuted. Hasn't happened yet? Maybe I should get off my wallet and buy a new one. Hope you don't get electrocuted as well. Keep on rocking in the free world. And your sweet voice massages my earballs every time I listen to you in my car. Love, Rick. That is a nice email. Thank you, Rick. And I'm glad you share the same uh, sentiment and story with the Nutribullet. It is gross. Every time you use it, it smells like garbage. And yeah, I am kind of scared of being electrocuted. I feel like there's a little pocket of water still in there. And every time I use it, it'll unlodge it. And I'll just get zapped. And that'll be how I die. Just one more time from the top. I'm going to read this email. Full, full conviction with the typos, okay? Hey, Julian. My name is Rick from Grand Berchois. My shake exploded in my bullet the other, sealed something on the up, beeped up. Anyways, motor pretty much cooked my delicious shake as it seeped through he bottom. Anyways, chucked it in the sink and passed through water. Still works, but every time I press down to blend, I have anxiety that I will get electrocuted. Hasn't happened yet. Maybe I should get off my wallet and buy a new one. Hope you don't go to, hope you don't get elec- electrocuted as well. Keep on rocking in the free world, and your sweet voice massages my earballs every time I listen to you in my car. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. All right, a couple more emails. Let's do this. Let's blast through. That was the longest one. The other ones are shorter. Okay. Hey, Julian. This is Connor from Toronto. I've been sitting on the toilet for the past hour listening to your podcast. I just noticed now that there's no toilet paper and it was a messy one. What should I do? Well, you can use your phone. Get in there. Use your phone. As, uh, use Always use a sock. That's a rule of thumb. If you have two socks, use one sock and throw out the pair. That's just what happens. Okay? You sacrificed your socks. But, Connor, if you're still listening... If you're downloading the next episode and you're still in the bathroom, or if you happen to find yourself in that situation again, just use your phone. They u- they use this in societies, not phones, but they'll use like rocks or tree bark, something solid that you can sort of get in there and scrape. They use that in cultures that they don't have toilet paper. And also our phones, I read a, a, an online article that said 
how disgusting our phones are. They're full of bacteria. There's actually already fecal matter bacteria on your phone for the most part, especially if you're taking it in with you when you go take a dump. So it's already soiled. May as well just use it. Just get a little uh, wet nap after that and you'll be fine. Thank you, Connor, and uh, good luck with that. Dear Julian, Tim from Hamilton. My girlfriend caught me masturbating. I wasn't embarrassed, but should I have been? I don't think you should have been. That de- Well, it's hard not to be, first of all. It's really hard not to be. I mean, I understand where you're coming from. It's never happened to me personally, but I feel like you shouldn't be embarrassed because it's something very normal, but at the same time, it's hard not to be when you're so vulnerable and you're just going at it and your girlfriend walks in. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that being embarrassing. I had my girlfriend walk into me peeing sitting down. That really happened. I was, you know, sometimes you're just lazy. And it wasn't like the middle of the night or anything like that. It was like midday, mid-afternoon, and I just sat on the toilet. I thought, hey, I'm not going to stand this time. I'm just going to sit, relax, take a load off for a second. And all of a sudden, like a ninja, she appeared around the corner I had the door open. She appeared around the corner and she's there walking towards the bathroom. So my instant reaction was to jump up right away and pull my pants up. So I couldn't even use the excuse that I was, you know, taking a dump or something. I was just up up with my pants up. So I panicked. I'm like, yeah, it was uh, really hot. My, uh, you know, getting getting some fresh air off that you get some good, good airflow off the, uh, the reflection off the toilet water it cools it, cools everything. It's just hot. It's a hot summer day. And I was mortified, so I can imagine, yeah, masturbating, you, should, you shouldn't be embarrassed, but you most likely were. Good luck with that. Another one here. Hey, Julian. Josh from Toronto. Why doesn't your website have photos of your guests? That's a good call. I will start that starting Friday. Next episode from now on. You know what, Josh? You should be proud of yourself. You're officially changing the format, the, the, your, the paradigm of the podcast. Now I will always take a picture with my guests and post it up on Facebook or, or the site. And I feel like I had one more. Okay, here we go. Last email. Hey, Julian, this is Kate from Vancouver. What was your most embarrassing moment? You mean out of life, Kate, ever? That's a tough one. This is such a generic question. I've been asked that before, and I never know how to answer, really. Um, nothing pop. I mean, I've, I've had many. Oh, okay, one pops in my mind, my brain, What right now. Embarrassing moment. I was in my teens, probably 17 years old, driving my bike down Street Shediac, where I'm from, in the southeast of New Brunswick, really fast on the road with my buddy Jermaine, and uh, I skip the curb, jump up on the curb with my bike, and my handlebars end up in my arm, my, my hands. I'm holding my handlebars, and I'm going really fucking fast, and uh, my knees clamp the bar, the middle bar there of the bike, and it starts leaning to the side. I skip the curb on the other side, down into a parking lot, and full speed hit a parked car in front of a Tim Hortons and Wendy's, which the Tim Hortons and Wendy's at that time was filled with people I knew, friends, and it was packed. So everyone saw me come in at light speed, hit this parked car, flip over the... Fl- I hit it right uh, like above the front driver's side wheel, fly over the hood, and helmet laws were a big thing back then, so I take my helmet out of my backpack that I was wearing. It wasn't, I didn't have my helmet on my head, so I take it out, I throw it on the side. I go into the, into the Tim Hortons or Wendy's um, bathroom, and the side of my head is fucking huge. It's just inflated. And the, the by the way, the Tim Hortons is silent when I walk in there. Just everyone's staring at me. Go from the door to the bathroom. I go in. And this guy's in the bathroom. He's like, oh my God, are you all right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm a little, sh- uh, you know, shaken, but I'm good. He's like, all right. So he leaves. I go back outside. It, this is the guy that was in the bathroom. It's his car. He's like, what the fuck happened? He went from super caring to like, what happened? 
told him what happened. And he calls the police. Meanwhile, again, all my friends are, I've got a ton of friends there. Calls the police and um, the police proceed to put my bike in the trunk and I get in the shotgun seat in the front and ride off in a cop car. That was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. Okay, that was emails. Let's now get to, uh, I said we'd run the monologue a little short, but I think this is, uh, we, we're, this is not short. So let's uh, move on to my guest, uh, the lovely and talented Jen Grant. We had a great chat, so enjoy that. And um, that's it. That's that. Enjoy Jen Grant. You and me below, just like the flowers, laughing all day long. People I need to lose Sing a little song Then take a shower Julian Dion Comedy hour. Then I heard this other story about a pet chimp who attacked uh, this woman's friend. Did you hear about that? Oh, it was a really sad story, but I have a joke about it. So, um... <laughs> here we go. This woman owned a pet chimp, which doesn't sound healthy to begin with. Good idea, just in your living room? That's weird. <laughs> then I heard that the chimp was on Xanax. I know, is that even a real situation happening on Earth? Like... <laughs> yeah, I know. So what happened was the, fr the chimp got out of its cage and freaked out because it didn't recognize its owner because she got a haircut. <laughs> I know, I find that funny too, I do. Because what a terrible way to find out your makeover worked, you know? <laughs> oh, I really do look different. <laughs> Rip. And... I thought, why would a woman want a pet chimp? But women are always complaining their, hu their husbands don't notice they got their hair done. This chimp was like, you got your hair done! Ah! So anyway, her friend, she called her friend to get the friend to help get the chimp back in the cage and the friend actually went over. Would you ever go over? How are you qualified, right? What's that, your pet chimp on Xanax is freaking out? I'll be right there. Let me just Google what to do. There's no Google for that. She's too good of a friend, that's the problem. She's too good. I, I can't even pick up my friends from the airport, okay? Hello, Rachel? Yeah, my pet Cobra's escapes in the tool shed. The lights are burnt out. You're gonna have to feel around for it. <laughs> yeah, I should mention that's on Oxycontin. <laughs> yeah, it didn't recognize me. I got my eyebrows waxed, so... Okay, that was my guest today, who sits in front of me, and uh, her best credit is her choice, her taste in men. This is my girlfriend. I'm gonna interview you normal though okay okay like as if i'm not your girlfriend and you're just yeah okay because some people will know some people won't know but but be serious so let's try not to laugh okay so i'll ask you questions that it sounds like a like that I've, i'll pretend i don't know th i'll lead you into things but we'll do it profesh okay okay yep okay so i'm gonna give you a real intro now okay okay that of course is my guest uh, that you heard just there doing what she does best uh, sitting in studios in front of me in front of my eyes mm -hmm. she's done everything you can do in this country when it comes to stand-up comedy in this country of course i mean canada she's done the just for laughs comedy festival uh, homegrown and she's recorded a gala there she has her own special on the comedy network comedy now she's done the halifax comedy festival several times she's done the winnipeg comedy festival a couple times She's entertained the troops in Israel and Egypt. She has been nominated for a Canadian Comedy Award. She's been on The Debaters, on CBC. The mm. list goes on and on, I think. And uh, she's here. You just heard her. Jen Grant. Hello. <laughs> um, thanks for doing the podcast. No, thank you for having me. And thank you for knowing all of my credits so well. You've been on before as part of the Mariah or Yoko segment they came up with. That is true. Okay. Anyway, you're here now. Yes. And uh, how many? I uh, mentioned your credits. J just uh, Halifax. How many times? Three times. Three times. Went it back two times. Two times. Two times. One time. Oh yeah. Okay, and you've been doing stand up for what? 
I started Amateur Night, Are You Ready? It's a long time ago in the 90s. It was the summer of 1998. I started doing stand-up. In at, Ottawa? In Ottawa at the uh, old Albert Club, the revered Albert Club. And now it's on Elgin, which, you know, I it's, it's a good club too, but there's nothing that compares to that Albert Club. For the listeners, uh, Yuck Yucks had a comedy club in the basement of the Capitol Suites Hotel on Albert Street, and it was there for about 25 years, and it was literally one of the best clubs in the country. Um, I mean, Norm MacDonald started there. Yep. Tom Green. Yeah, Mike McDonald. Mike McDonald. Who else? I know that, um, oh yeah, you said Tom Green. Yeah. I feel like we're missing one person. Jen Grant. Jen Grant. Dan um, Aykroyd. No, I'm making that one nah. up. Right? Um. Yeah. Anyway, and it was there for 25 years, and it moved about six years ago to Elgin Street to a location, and it's not even close to what it used to be. It just the new space doesn't have much character in it, and um, comparatively. Anyway, I can't see you. Yeah. I'm trying to have weird setup. Um. <laughs> so you started 16 years ago on Amateur Night, and back then yes. it was different. Like now, when someone starts comedy, they get up on stage. They can easily get up five, six times a week. Back then, it was like how often? Oh, it's crazy. It was once a month if you didn't miss the sign in that sign up time. So I think it was the first Tuesday of every month you called in to try to get one Wednesday in that month. But if you forgot to call then you just didn't have a, a spot for the whole month. And there was no rooms going on. There was no a- other club. So if the most I could have done for the first two years of doing stand-up was once a month. And you did that for two years? I once did, a month? I did it once a month for... Oh, and then when you got better, you could do twice a month if there was enough space available. But you had to prove yourself by doing once a month. Okay. So... And um, Julian's taking his pants off. <laughs> <laughs> Loosening them. Anyway, um, okay, so he did... Uh, I know this story is really exciting. <laughs> you want to take your pants off. Uh, you do that for two years. I did that for two years, what, once a month, maybe the first year, and then I started getting twice a month spots. And, and there was nothing else back then. There was no open mics or anything like no, that. It was just... A lot has changed. And uh, I can't believe it's been 16 years, but that's crazy to me. And what were you doing on the side for, for, because you're just getting into stand-up. What background did you have? Uh, I had gone to Second City to do improv classes. And um, it's funny that you're interviewing me right now because you know this whole story. But um, uh, yeah, I, I, you know what? I went to university to be a reporter because I realized after knowing that I'd trying that and realizing I didn't want to do it and it was a lot of work so I I just came to all this realization that I really wanted to just be an entertainer a performer on some level and I wasn't sure it was going to be stand-up I kind of fell into stand-up I've always been funny ish I guess how do you just fall into stand-up well I had a friend who was doing stand-up and um he encouraged me to do try it and you tried how was your first set my first set went well, but I barely remember it. I just, my first few years was just me getting up there, memorizing everything, saying it as quick as possible and getting off stage. Do you I, remember a joke? One of your first jokes? My, I remember the first joke I ever well, wrote. Okay, let's do it. Let's hear it. Well, Jen okay. Grant's 16 years, first joke ever on stage. Okay, so I remember it. Okay, I don't know if I'm going to say it exactly, but the premise was... That when people used to, when people get high, they would say, oh, do you want to come over and we'll get baked? And I was like, baked? That doesn't sound like fun. You're baking your brain. And that was the premise of the joke. So the whole idea that anytime we get drunk or party, it's the worst names possible. That's the premise. So I would be like, "Uh, you want to come over and get baked? Baked? That doesn't sound good. And then when I showed up, Everybody was just staring at the wall, and I was like, ding, I think you're done, like as if they were cookies. It was a brilliant, <laughs> brilliant joke. <laughs> then I was like, um, when you get um, when you get drunk, you... Uh, Is your nose okay? It's really itchy. I don't know if it's a microphone or what, but... Just as long as you keep talking into the mic. 
I am. Okay, keep going. Can you? I don't know if you can. T- uh, Julian is ruder to me than <laughs> any other guest he's ever had. Um. Okay, so keep going. The joke. Ding, you're done. I think you're done. Yeah, and then um, I, have you ever noticed that all of the terms we use for partying are is so destructive? It's terrible. It's like, um, wasted and bombed like imagine a family from a war tour in country called canada because they were interested in moving here they're like hey do you get bombed fucking right we do i just got bombed last night hell i'm half in the bag right now me and the boys were getting tanked tonight and then i just went on and on going uh like shit face that's the worst one i don't know about you but poo is the last thing i want on my face that was my first joke <laughs> Uh, in that whole joke, my favorite part is that someone's in a war-torn country and they want a better life and they decide to call Canada. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they find a phone, call the country. Hello, Canada. We're just, we're moving, we're coming over there, but we just, before we leave, we just would like to know, do you guys get bombed over there? <laughs> They're very direct in their questions, very um, thorough uh, screening process. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> you do it for two years once a month when do you make the leap from from this is what i'm going to do full time to just falling into it or when well, do you go from falling into it and just sort of doing it once a month for two years to taking it really seriously okay so um when i first started doing stand-up i was doing other things too i was still kind of in the television world and i wasn't sure what i was doing i was just trying it and I was getting a little bit better at it and then I'm like well maybe I'll just continue doing it if I keep getting better at it I'll just keep on doing it and if it gets to be more a little more fun every time because it was torture for the first little while so then I just decided um I got to make a decision am I taking this seriously or am I not am I going to try this as a career so then after four years of living in Ottawa um i decided i needed to move because you do have to move like you don't some people make it work don kelly makes it work and he's really really funny and don kelly a uh, local comedian in ottawa and he's very successful yeah and but i mean it's unusual to be able to have like a full time and he does have like he does a lot of other stuff too but anyway so i decided that i wanted to it was a good idea for me to leave so i moved to vancouver and um, that's when I took it really seriously. I started doing like five shows a week. And how many years were you into stand up when you four years? Four years. And you <laughs> why? Because I know it, but I know listeners don't. Um, Julian knows everything about me because he's my boyfriend. Let's just put it out okay. there. That's your best credit. So four years in, you move and you go from doing it. Once a month, to tw- maybe twice a month at that point, I'm going to guess, four years in, to five times a year. How is the transition, five times a week, how is the transition going from Ottawa, safe, everyone knows each other in the comedy community, you're all sort of friends, and then you go into a city where you didn't know anybody, I'm guessing, and uh, then you sort of dive in and start doing it. Like, And why Vancouver? Most people would move to Toronto. Mm-hmm. Well... And I was going to move to Toronto, but I had uh, I was talking to someone who recommended Vancouver to me. Um, it was a random thing, but you know, my whole life I've been attracted to the West Coast for no real reason. I had no family or friends that lived out there, but I was always it was like this gravitational force kind of attracting me there. And um, so when he was like, you know, it's a good place to do stand up, it's a good place to develop, I was like, okay, you know what? I felt like I, I was kind of like in a bad place then. I felt like I needed a change. So I moved there and I didn't know a lot of people, but I did have a cousin and I stayed with that cousin for a while. And then um, it was great. It was really outside of my comfort zone because Ottawa it, to this day is a safe place to do stand up and people are taking more risks there now. But when I was there, it was very comfortable and people did the same material a lot that just the way it was there so that's the way I thought it was then I went to Vancouver and people were teasing me comics were teasing me there like oh hello Ottawa in what way like why were they teasing you specifically I think because I was very structured I was very like hi here are my jokes I am doing my jokes right now 
So if anything happened uh, in the audience or whatever, you may not address it. You just sort of plow through and stick to your act. Totally. And I, I would just stick to my act no matter what. And I wouldn't take as many chance, chances. But I think it comes with the territory. If, if Ottawa had, at that point, five opportunities to be on stage in a week, I probably would have been more loose. But when you're doing stand-up once a month... Yeah, you want to you you want to show your your chops and you want to be polished and you can't you're not encouraged to take risks or you know you can you can bomb more if you're going up five times a week because the next show is the next night and it doesn't matter but if you're going up once a month you want to avoid bombing at all costs and especially early on in your career you feel like every set counts so much you feel like the whole world is watching so you just want to do well so you do the same material over and over but you're not uh, de- developing more work so you're in Vancouver you're going up five times a week w- who did you hang out with did you meet some comics there yes well the other thing I wanted to say about what you just said even when to this day, if I go and I do a tour or I'm, uh, I do a bunch of shows in what, like in, in a three week span, I'm feeling looser already because you just have to get out. It's like exercising. It's like anything. If you only do it once a month, the next time you go up, you almost forget how to do it, especially that yeah. early on. So mm-hmm. being there five nights a week doing stand up, you get sick of your act too. So there's no way you're going to do the same material over and over and over five times a week anybody that's a, that's a psycho person that does that psycho it does happen though hobbyists are there and they go five out nights and do a this. week though yeah you're right no if they're hobbyists they don't usually do it five times a week no yeah. you're right so um so anyways when i moved there um i i it was you know looking back it was an exciting time because i was still really like figuring who i was out and cutting the apron strings that was really the first time i ever moved away from my family and figured out who i was as an individual not defined by my family and my past and um i remember sitting down with the georgia Strait, the entertainment weekly Mm -hmm. newspaper and looking at the listing of all the comedy shows like that's I look back on that. I'm like, oh my God, I just went there. I had no idea what to do or who was there or anything about the comedy scene. And I look in and I see there's a women's comedy show, open mic. That's literally a two minute walk from my cousin's place. Was it a regular, regular occurring thing or was like a one-off open women's open mic? I feel like it was a regular one or maybe it was like a regular show and they were just doing a special edition of it that night and so i was like oh i'm definitely going to that it was a two minute walk away from where i was so i go i go there and there's this girl on the show that i really like and i really identify with she was very funny and very smart and i remember she had this joke that she said um i'm a bank teller and that's why every day a little piece of me dies. I was laughing hysterically at that because like I just I used to be a bank teller and I felt like I was dying a slow death and I only did it until I was like 20. Mm-hmm. So uh I was like I'm probably going to be friends with her. And to this day she's one of my best friends. Ah. <laughs> and who is she? who is she? It's Erica Sigurdsson. Okay. Erica, shout out. And E-Sig. Mm-hmm. I was looking through some old boxes of like little journals. I used to write in journal and I have this entry back in 2003 saying, I saw this girl on stage today. She was very funny. And anyway, it was Erica and now we've been mm-hmm. friends. She's one of my best friends. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, you get the Georgia Strait, you do show. Who else was on that women's show? Anyone? Um, I feel like, you know, it's hard to remember because I didn't have anything to attach to, but I, I think maybe Dane Alexander was on it. Um, and you know, what was cool about that night was, um, there was some, um, drag queens on the, on the, on the show, on the show as well. Hmm. Um, because where I was staying was very close to, um, the gay neighborhood in Vancouver on uh, right by Davy. Mm-hmm. So there was, uh, two drag queens on the show. And I have to say, I admired their showmanship. They had, there was barely anyone in the audience. There was like maybe four people in the audience. 
and they had costume changes and music cues. And I was like, wow, I can at <laughs> least write a new joke, you know? Right. It's funny that you, you ended up going to a women's show, uh, a show billed as a women's show, because you are known for really not liking, I mean, uh, known. Under, understandably, no, but you've, you've, yeah. outs- you've been outspoken about this. You hate when people categorize you or pigeonhole you as a female comic or give you a compliment. It's such a backhanded comment when someone will be like, you're, you're really good. I don't lo- usually like female comics or, you know, or you're really funny for a female comic or female, 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 female all the time. Talk about that a little bit. Well, yeah, I don't like, that's such a difficult thing to talk about because I get all fired up, but Get fired up. Do I it. I think it's good to it's have... Good for the ratings. In some ways, I see why people want to have all women's shows or festivals because they want to highlight um, an area that is underrepresented. But I don't think it's a good idea in some ways because by having... You're kind of segregating. You're saying, look, look at the females. Like, they're different from the males. So I don't really like all female shows for that reason. And and I just, I guess like anyone, I would just like to be recognized for being good at what I do, not only in my gender, but as a whole. Mm-hmm. I remember Alex Wood, who's a comic who lives in Toronto now. He made a very good point. He's originally from Ottawa too. He made a good point. He said, the thing about being a female comic is no matter how good you get, you will never be considered a Louis CK. Mm -hmm. And that is it bang on because no matter how good a female comic will get, they'll just still be a female comic. Well, what if you look like uh, I, this is a big example, but like a Joan rivers, she's transcended that. I mean, she was current and, and do you think she was still labeled as a female comic or just a comic? Uh, she has such a big personality. I don't know. I mean, she might, I, I wish we could ask her because I wouldn't know how she's, you know, she, she doesn't get in that. She's not in that category because she's so, she was so famous, I think. Mm-hmm. And she, her personality was so huge that she, she just was in her own entity. It was like not even, so I don't know. Well, you are pretty funny for a female. Nah. Nah, nah, nah. Um, Okay. Well, you didn't get that fired up. I was, I, th- I was thought you could get more fired up. Well, I could talk more about it. Do it. Well, um, I do get upset when people say you're funny for a female because that's that. I mean, that's the same as going up to a doctor who's female and say you're pretty smart for a female doctor. Mm-hmm. And I and people don't even realize it's sexist. That's what bothers me. It's like it's very very sexist but everybody thinks it's okay to do even other women women will come up to me after a show in the audience and say stuff like that yeah women do you hear it all the time okay well having said that it's it sucks and it is uh it's sexist basically but on the flip side do you feel or do you think that there was that okay. <laughs> do you think that there would be there is maybe because I've heard this school of thought. Some people say that there's more opportunity for women because, for example, uh, when they book festivals or certain shows or tours, they feel it's almost like people want to have a certain quota of women on the roster to keep it diverse. And because there's not a lot of women comedians, there's you know, a lot less than guys. Would you not think that there are more opportunities for a woman, a woman than there would be for like a, just a regular guy? Definitely. I mean, there's, there's that too. So it's like, yeah, I get annoyed with not being considered just a comic. I'm always a female comic, but I do, I will admit I get opportunities, more opportunities than a guy of equal ability Mm -hmm. of me with me because I stand out. How many female comics are there in Canada? There are definitely not a lot, especially at your level. There's a handful. Yeah. So. Whereas there's a slew of white average men. Yeah. So it's definitely more competitive. No, it's true. And I mean, for sure, for sure. Like I've done, I've done more things 
than somebody because I, I know especially living in toronto you st- you realize how many good comics there are here mm-hmm. there's a lot of a good, comics. good comics so let's talk about those opportunities so you moved to vancouver and what's the first big thing that you got like serious credit because you got a lot of things pretty early on in your career where you went over the troops uh, entertained the troops in egypt and israel which we'll get into in a little bit but what's the first real like credit where you thought okay i'm i'm a, I'm a comic now i'm serious sort of like validation a little bit it's a good question i didn't think this at the time but the first the most exciting thing that happened to me when i first moved to vancouver was um getting i opened for the puppetry of the penis which yeah okay y- you've told you've told said this told said this to me <laughs> before told me the story <laughs> Explain to people, because I had no idea what the Puppet of the Penis was. It's a big touring thing. They go in theaters and explain a little bit what they do. Yeah. It, this, the show uh, originated in Australia. And these two Australian guys, it's crazy what they made it this big success. They basically do dick tricks. So they manipulate their penis and balls into different shapes. And it's a whole show built around this. Yeah. And they're on a giant theater stage. Yeah. And they have a focus. They have a camera that is has a, sh- uh, what do you call that? Uh, close up. Of, Zoom in. Yeah. yeah of their uh, junk, if you will. And they'll do like, uh, you know, a hamburger. So basically, if you can imagine the... <laughs> So the patty would be the penis, the shaft, and then the two balls would be buns. So they would stick it all together and then twist it so that it was, so that it was like, yeah, so it looked like a hamburger. Anyway, the guys, when I first went there to do the show, it was a big deal because it was the biggest audience I've ever performed for. How many people? Um, I'm going to say like 2,000. And it's all over Western Canada? You're, do, you're I did, yeah, Western Canada dates. So the first one I ever did was I went to Calgary. I had no clue what I was doing. I was still so new. I show up. I've gotten this itinerary. But remember, I'm not used to traveling. So I just show up at this hotel. I have no... I barely fly, okay? I'm just like, hmm? How did you get it? Did, did you get the booking, first of all? Well, um, because I guess Christine Von Hagen, who's a very funny comic, um, and I believe Kate Davis were doing... Christine was the first one, and they liked female comics opening. So they both those girls couldn't... Those women... See, there you go. That That's how I got that opportunity. Right. Because there there weren't a lot of female comics, so they knew I was out west, and they needed an, a western comic to open up for that part of their tour. So somebody recommended me, and um, oh, I was like beyond excited and nervous. So I show up at the hotel. I have no clue. I feel so like deer in headlights. I just show up at the hotel and like, hello, I'm Jennifer Grant to check in. I was mm. like, at the Delta. It was all fancy. And then um, they're like, yeah, we have room for you. And then there was like a message from somebody from the tour. I'm like, okay. And then I asked them where the theater was. So I walked over there. I get there at the side door and I ring the doorbell and somebody comes over to greet me. And then as I'm walking in, I see two guys walking around with no pants on. (laughs) Their dicks are hanging out. And they don't think it's a big deal because they're so used to everybody just staring at their penis constantly. Right. That they're just standing there, and I'm very impressionable. Like, this is not only my very first time doing this unbelievably huge tour for me. It was like this... I mean, I'm used to doing small little bars with, like, seven people in the audience. All of a sudden, I'm showing up at this theater, and men are walking around with no pants on. Mm-hmm. Like, nothing gets you used to that. So, I walk in, and I'm like... He's like, are you the comedian? Are you Jennifer? And I was like, oh, uh, I Hi. Like, I said it like that because I'm looking at their dicks. Like, <laughs> And he's like, hey, nice to meet you. Like, as if I their dicks weren't hanging out. <laughs> anyway, so we ended up, um, it was a lot of fun hanging out with them. It was, um, one guy was from Brazil. The other one was Australian. And one of the Australian guy, I remember him saying that he needed to quit soon because he felt like he was almost borderline damaging his dick. Stretching it too much. Yeah. Were they big Because he wanted to have kids. They must have had the big, big if they're... Yeah, you have to be a certain size to do it. Oh, it's the size, you know? There's a test, yeah. There's a test. What is it? 
So you put your wrist up to your dick, like at the bottom, the base of it. And if you can do the wrist watch, which I'm sure you can Google that listeners, if you want to know what it is, it's called the wrist watch because you put your hand down by where your dick is and then you wrap your dick around. And if you can hold your hand there with the end of your dick tucked in underneath, so on the inside of your wrist... It should be tucked there, and you can go, hey, what time is it? As if it's your wristwatch, then you your dick is big enough. If you can't do that, there's no point of even auditioning. That's funny. And there was a guy in the audience. Like, there was obviously mostly women in the audience. But one time there was this guy there, and I think it was, like, some girl's boyfriend, and he was pretty young. I'm going to say he was maybe at the most 22. And some – there's a point in the show where – one of the puppetry guys said, say, um, who would like, who would anyone out there like to try to do the hamburger? And like, no one would ever volunteer, but this one place we were in, some guy put up his hand and said, yeah, I want to try it. He was drunk. He could tell he was drunk. And he, I think regretted it big time by the time he got up there. Cause I think he, I think, I don't know how it works with men's penises, but it's like, I think he looked like it did shrunk because he was nervous. You know what I mean? It was like, it got smaller. He wasn't a wristwatch. He was barely a pocket watch. He was nothing. It was like, and then I felt really bad for him because there's these two guys that are up there and they're like all, you know, used to it and dicks hanging right out half hard. That's the other thing I don't understand. Their dicks looked half hard. So how do you move it like that if it's half hard? I don't know. And then I said to him, um one of the guys one of the puppetry guys what do you do if you get turned on like he goes oh you can't get a heart on that's like the worst you can't get an erection it's like you can't i said well what do you do though like wh- you get volunteers sometimes come up on the stage if it's a woman and you know she's doing something and you get turned on what do you do and he told me this i'll never forget it was really strange he keeps a cold spoon and he'll just touch the spoon on his dick to make it cold and it would make mm. it go limp. And that's weird. I know. We should have known that in high school. Nah. <laughs> um, Do not get hard on <laughs> in the past for other. Um, I don't understand. Uh, this full hour, like how long are these shows? Yeah. Is there a story? Is there an arc? W- what do they do? They just. Arc. <laughs> like, I don't get it. Um. Yeah. For two hours? Like, how long is the show? Yeah. It's like. Maybe an hour. And they just do like, here's a hamburger, here's a wristwatch, here's a yeah, they turtle. Yeah, they have funny like little jokes in between and like someone's written a show. I can see that lasting for like 15 minutes. I can't wrap my head around well, a full show. that's because you're not a housewife from the suburbs. That's true. Okay, so you go and you do your first show. How how are the crowds? Because you hadn't performed in any venue like that. So what was it like? Insane. That first night in Calgary... I, the way I describe it is I did my first joke and the reaction from 2000 people, I felt like my hair moved from mm-hmm. that. It was crazy, overwhelming, amazing. And I was able to be dirty. Like I'm not a dirty comic, but knowing that you, they want you to talk about dicks. Cause that's what the whole show is. It's about yeah. dicks. And you said, you said this before where it was an environment free of comedians, so there was no cynicism or overanalyzing anything. You could just like totally just do anything. Yeah, it's true. You, it was like the first time that I realized how my performance affected what I thought the other comics thought of me. Like you don't realize how you feel until sometimes when it's not there. So it's like I didn't think I cared so much about what other comics thought of me. But when I moved to Vancouver, I could feel the stare of these comics in the back of the room going, oh, here we go, Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Like, let's see what you're made of. And then, so it was right around that time that I moved there. It felt very much under a microscope. Like, Mm -hmm. what is this? Why is she getting a spot? Why is this girl on? Mm -hmm. And then I go to do this tour, and I realize how free and, like, not not caring I uh what people thought of me well i'm not very articulate right now but it's like this freedom on stage yeah and how many shows was that tour Uh, i think it was like five Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was really fun and how do you find going from that to bars again um 
Well, I mean, I thought it was okay to do that because, yeah, I, but I knew that that was special. Mm-hmm. Like, I knew I wasn't going to be like, oh, it's only theater tours from here on end yeah. with jigs. How many minutes did you have to do off the top? I think it was like 20 minutes. And did you have 20 minutes at that point? I did have 20 minutes yeah. at that point, yeah. Hmm. That's pretty good. Well, I mean, I had four years. Right. Of, yeah. Okay, so then you go back to Vancouver. Yeah. And um, at some point, you get Egypt and Israel to go entertain the troops. How does that come about? So um, there used to be this room that Yak Yaks did in Regina, Saskatchewan. And um, I remember I was working with Marta Chavez, who's a very funny comic uh, in living here in Toronto. And she... Her and I, she was headlining and I was middling and she had invited a friend of uh, hers down to see the show who lived in Regina and this woman had already pitched a military show tour in the past and got Marta to go on it with her so she was a good connection. So it was one of those fluky situations where um, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Like who knew, who knew that Regina, this gig in Regina would bring about me going to the Middle East to entertain the troops. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Like this woman happened to be there and she said, would you be interested in going to the Middle East to do a military show tour? And I was like, yes. So she put me in the pitch for this thing. It got accepted. And you don't have an agent or anything dealing this for you? you No, I just went with it. And um, yeah, so I went there for right before Christmas and uh it was an incredible experience talk about that a little bit how long were you over there i was the whole thing was two weeks and um it what you were the only comedian it was like a troupe of like performers musicians dancers Dancers, singers and uh and like a band there was a band and it was called the gur it was a girls uh a girls ladies tour so it was like all women Except there was like one guy, a couple guys in the band. And um, yeah, I was the only comic. So there was one night where we were entertaining. um, There was only 25 soldiers in Egypt at this one camp. And um, there was about 400 people in the audience. But there was only 25 English speaking. But I found out afterwards, like... A lot of people thought my jokes were just a long intro to a song. <laughs> so, because, you know, you can dance and sing. And even if you don't understand the language, you can still enjoy it because music and movement are a universal language. But um, me talking about my hip hugger jeans and, <laughs> you know, they're like, what is wrong with this woman? <laughs> and um, talk about the Bedouin people. And the first time you've ever ridden a camel. First and only and last. <laughs> so they, when you go on a military show tour like that, they have military ex, uh, um, escorts because they want to make sure that you're you're safe. It, obviously, that they're like really, really, really anal retentive about that, which they should be because it's crazy place to be visiting and... So they would have these very organized, scheduled activities. So every day had a plan, like this is what you're doing from this time to that time, this time to that time. So one of the days we had a day off and there was no show. So we were going to tour Egypt. And we were going to go and see the pyramids, but um, we couldn't do that because there was the route that we would have to take was like literally a war zone. It was like that was a real pl- that was, I was really there. So were the pyramids closed or just the the route like just to get there? Just to get there it was too dangerous so they analyzed and they say okay well we would like to take these people to have this tourist uh experience but they looked at the route and the stuff that was going on there was too violent at that very at that particular time so we couldn't go and see the pyramids. I was going to ask is is it dangerous do you feel the element of danger like when you get there cuz you had I, you had never left the continent I'm guessing? No. You had just Okay, so you go to Egypt. How far how long of a flight? It was a 12-hour flight from Newark. Okay. And to then Tel Aviv. 
and you get to Israel, and what's that like? Are you like, holy shit, where am I? Right away. Yeah, yeah. you can feel it. Right away, you can feel it. And then we got on a bus. And um, we had a pit stop because we were driving, I forget where we were driving to that first night. And we stopped at uh, a McDonald's and we walked into the McDonald's and at the door, there's a doorman at the McDonald's checking your bag mm. for bombs. Crazy. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I think it's easy to forget how unsafe it is because you live a whole life in a place like Canada and you quickly go back to that comfort, like, I'm going to be okay. Because it's just the what you're used to, even though you forget where you are. Because at one point, we crossed from Israel in a bus to Egypt at the border. And right before we did that, I looked over and there was like a Hilton hotel that was half demolished. And that was because it had been bombed. But we just drove from the hotel we were at, which was only like 20 minutes from that place. Mm-hmm. Or wherever. It wasn't that long. Maybe it was a little longer than 20 minutes. But still, the perspective of it, it's like, you know, from here to, I don't know, Hamilton? And then there's like, so you realize, oh my God, if you think of it from Toronto to Hamilton, it's like, that's an hour away. Yeah. And if you just drove an hour, you could be in an environment where you were in that hotel instead. Mm -hmm. And you could have been killed. So, yeah. Somebody had bombed that hotel that close to where we were staying. All right. So you feel, you definitely feel out of place Mm. and not super safe, entirely safe. Okay. And so you're on this planet trip and the pyramids, you can't get to the pyramids. So what what do they decide to do? So they decide to do probably something even more interesting. I mean, looking back on it, we, they kind of hired this local guy who knew a family, a Bedouin family, which were nomads in the desert. And um, so he took us to visit this family. Just What's a nomad? A nomad is like someone who lives like, uh, lives uh, on a, um, not under the same system. Like they have a loophole somehow and they don't pay taxes. And it's like, they're just these, uh, yeah, like the, their property, they kind of get a, away with not paying property taxes and being part of the system by not completely building their, their roof. That's what they were telling us that technically their home is not really a house because they don't have a complete roof. Right. And they're just in the middle of the desert. It's crazy. Like, so we're driving and driving and driving and driving in this bus like crazy, crazy. Like there's nothing. It's just sand and more sand and more sand and vastness. You don't understand unless you're there. You're just like it is. I mean, people joke about Saskatchewan being flat. I mean, not that this place was flat. It was actually beautifully hilly. And like the way that sand lands and with the wind currents and everything, it was like it looked like art. And you just be driving and driving and there's nothing and there's nothing. And then boom, there's a camel. It's like, where did you drink any water or anything? Like, Then they get it in their humps. Yeah. But like, shit, where? And, it, and then so then you drive and you drive and you drive and there'd be nothing and nothing and nothing. And then there, boom, there's a guy sitting on the side of the road. It's like, where did you come from? Like, how far away? Like, there's no car. There's no... It's just some dude just sitting there on the floor, on the ground. So anyway, we finally get to their house and it's not even a house. When I say it's a house, it's like I have, I have stayed in like, it was rustic beyond. Okay. There's no, they don't have a floor. It's just the sand. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Just four walls. What are, what's the house made of? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's just like wood and. It just felt like nothing. It felt like, well, I hope there's no windstorm because you guys are fucked. Yeah. So anyway, there was a Tina Turner. Imper- Obviously no power or anything. It's just- no power. Yeah. It's insane. Right now they're in the desert right now. Mm-hmm. Think about that. Right now they're in the desert with a camel that's tied up. Like that's. Well, that because when was that trip? That was in 2004. That particular family is probably all dead. But yeah, there's probably some <laughs> people right now. <laughs> So, um, there's a Tina Turner impersonator on our tour who was Muslim and she was able to talk to these, this family. Uh, the other thing was there was a rule that only women were allowed to go in the house and get a tour of what the house looked like. 
So like I told you, there was a couple guys that were on the tour that were in the band. Mm -hmm. And so they had to stay behind. They Be couldn't see the house. They couldn't go in the house. S step on the territory. Yeah, it's crazy. So we went into uh, the house and got a tour. And honestly, I would not want to live there. But they seemed happy. They seemed very happy. Um, oh, and I wanted to take a picture of the camel toe just just to be funny and ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying with my camera to take a picture. And I think it was an actual camera. It wasn't a phone because I didn't yeah. have a cell phone then. So I was using my camera to take a picture of the camel toe. And the little boy who didn't understand what I was saying or doing, obviously, he, uh, he was like, oh, uh, let me pull the camel so that it's closer to you. But he's saying it in Arabic. And... Um, He's like pulling the camel and the camel got mad at him and then kicked him. Kicked the kid. Kicked the kid. How old was this kid? Like maybe seven. And the kick, kid went flying. Like, ha like hard? Hard. Well, it's a huge camel and he kicked him <laughs> and the kid went flying. <laughs> See, like I said, they all, they're all dead. Yeah. And then so, <laughs> and so of course I scream and I'm like, oh my God. Like I was so worried for this little boy. All the other kids were just laughing and pointing at him, and no one cared. If I was in Canada, <laughs> you would be rushing that kid to the hospital. But no one cared. And was he all right? Yeah. Yeah, he was fine. He just was kind of crying, but then shook it off. Like. And did you ride ever ride a camel? <laughs> I did, Julian. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Julian knows the story. So uh, I got on the camel, and that was part of the trip. Like, you get to ride a camel. And I'm like, okay, fine. I didn't really want to, but... I got on the camel, and the camel was disgusting. Like, I know that sounds rude. I love animals. This camel, oh, my God. They say camels uh, spit. They don't spit. It's like they mouth fart, okay? There was these gross, stinky sounds coming from their mouth, and this gross spit on the side and bubbles just dripping off of their mouth. And I, you know what? That's when I realized, like, I was just too overstimulated. Like I couldn't handle everything. It was too much. Like the camel, the desert, eating all these foods that I don't normally eat. I'm I'm in the Middle East. I'm doing shows for the truth. Like it's it was too much in my brain. I was just like I started to feel sick. So I was like, "Can I get off the camel?" Like I was scared. I felt like the whole desert was spinning. I w I felt like I did acid once. And I felt like it was the same feeling of doing acid. There was nothing I could cling on to that seemed like familiar at all. Mm -hmm. When I was did that, I did acid one time. I, it felt like I was on a different planet because there was nothing made sense. That's how it felt when I was on the camel. And I just, it just, it just hit a climax. And I was like, get me off this camel. And they're like, yeah, it's almost done. I'm like, I want off now. Like I was like a real <laughs> bummer. And they're like, okay. <laughs> So then I get off and I was like, <laughs> like traumatized. Then we drive back <laughs> to, the, they're like, yay, drive back to the. I, I imagine like from your perspective, you know, you everything, like you said, there's nothing familiar, The everything's spinning. You're like in the Middle East and you just had a panic attack. But from, <laughs> I'd love to think like from their perspective, they're just like, okay, here you go, grown woman. Just get on the camel. I you know, get on, you start I know, freaking I out. Get me off this thing. I was like, now. And they're like, yeah, it's almost done. I'm like, I need down now. <laughs> they're like, okay. <gasps> then, like, the Muslim woman is like, I would like rights. <laughs> You're <laughs> like, anyway, so um, so we get off. I get off, and then we get on the bus again, and we drive back to the military camp. And we were eating in the officer's mess, like that, you know, the cafeteria. Yeah, like a hall. Yeah. And, um... Anyway, I was trying... The food is very rich there. Mm -hmm. Like, it's calorically heavy for a reason. They want their soldiers to be strong and big. And um, anyway, so I was feeling very nauseous from my camel experience and being in the desert. I just felt overwhelmed. So I was, like, actually physically sick from that. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I have to eat something. I hadn't eaten anything all day, and I knew I had to eat something. So I got, like, a carrot stick... Literally, that's how light it was. It was a side plate with like iceberg lettuce, <laughs> a carrot stick, and a celery stick with some ranch dressing on it. 
and I tried to eat like two tiny minuscule bites of a carrot and then I had to run to the bathroom and throw it up because I had a thought of the camel. Like I just remembered the camel. I was like, I gotta go. And I puked up a carrot. And if, did you the people that you were with know that this was happening? Oh yeah, the, it was a big joke. It was like, what <laughs> is wrong with this like pussy from Canada? Well, they were all from Canada, but and so they played a joke on me. Actually, um, they all got together behind my back and bought like a stuffed camel, <laughs> and then they hid it in my suitcase. So when I flew back to Canada, I opened up my suitcase and there was a camel, and of course I screamed. Did you puke? Yeah, uh, no, but mm. I screamed. Actually? Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't know how. And it goes to show you how easy it is to sneak something into someone's suitcase. I didn't even see them do that. So you lied to the airport when they asked you if you had packed your own <laughs> yeah, bags. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and why why not do that in Israel? That seems like a safe place yeah, to do that. Stuff, something not in Pearson bag. International Airport. Let's do that in Tel Aviv. Um. I, I heard a story of you finding a baby in a hotel one time <laughs> on that trip. <laughs> yes. So one time I was in... Um, one, ta- one time. you were uh, That was on that trip, right? Yeah. Oh. But we stayed in a couple of different places. Okay. Do not fight with me. So I was in this hotel and um, I could hear a baby in the hallway. I could hear literally like it was like a cartoon. And I'm thinking, oh, that's weird. Like, but I can hear it through the door. Like I'm just doing my own thing, getting ready to go. And um, I'm like, well, and so I keep hearing it. But it's weird because I don't hear an adult's voice. And it's again, it's one of those things that you wouldn't think would sound weird. But you're just expecting an adult to go, okay, come on over here, Jimmy, you know, or whatever. Mm-hmm. So anyway, all I hear is, so I finally open the door and I look over and there's just this baby in the hallway by itself with no adult. How y- how young of a baby? I'm talking two. Two-year-old. Two-year-old. It's alone. You're in Israel in a hotel. Yeah. What floor are you staying on? Uh, I think it was like maybe the eighth or something. So it's a big, it's a big building. Yeah, it's a big hotel. So then I go back in and I think, well, obviously there must be an adult. What do I hear five minutes later? (laughs) Still, I open the door. It's still no adult. And I'm like, okay, there's clearly no one here. So I rush. I get ready. I'm going downstairs anyway, but I did it sooner because I'm like, I've got to help this kid. This baby's just walking the hallways of this hotel. (laughs) And so I get one of the other dancers and I'm like, let's call downstairs and see what's going on with this with this baby so I call down and I'm like this is gonna sound really weird but there's a baby roaming the hallways of right outside of my hotel room and by itself it's like a two-year-old baby and the guy in the front desk was like oh my god this woman is looking for her baby she's hold can you grab the baby and bring it down I was like okay so then I had to like pick up this strange baby who doesn't want me to pick him up. He's old enough that he's like, I don't know who you are and why are you touching me? Mm-hmm. So I pick up this baby because I have to. Of course, on our way down, every floor is t- pressed or at least every second. So there's a lot of stops. And Wait, this baby, baby is up? crying, mm-hmm. like like losing Did it. Did he start crying as soon as you picked him up? Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. And then I can't even console it in... Cause I don't, I can't speak Arabic. Mm. So then I'm trying to, but I'm like, it's okay. And then, and then, uh, so as we're going down, like people are getting on the elevator wondering like why I'm not, cons- like why, why is this the white redhead is- have an Arabic crying yeah. baby? And like the kid is like staring at my face bawling too. It's not like it's just crying like normal cry. So then we get down to the ground floor and the, the door is open and this woman is like oh, blah, 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 in Arabic that was racist and then grabs the baby and doesn't even say thank you mm. just grabs her baby and leaves and she maybe has that's what she was saying to you maybe she was saying oh my god thank no, you thank you thank she you. never looked in my eyes like if if somebody had maybe saved, she was telling her baby thank the lady thank the lady for bringing you back <laughs> there's no way you know what everybody and I noticed that's the manners are different there mm-hmm. people are very like they'll bump into you they don't care like there was a really delicious delicious buffet there and people would just knock right into you they wouldn't care 
they would bump right in, grab the food almost off your plate if you hadn't eaten it yet. Like it was, it's just manners are different. Well, especially compared to here, we're so soft and polite here. Almost too polite, I think. So you gave the baby back and nothing. Nothing. All right, and you just go back go about your day. Well, then you I saved go, this baby's life. Basically. Oh, I know. I was like, and then I, so I get on the bus, and one of the military escorts was like, "I'm telling the story because I can't believe that." I've just found this random baby. And so I'm telling the story to everybody. And then one of the military escorts was like, oh, yeah, I saw that baby, too. And I'm like, and you just kept walking? Like, who does that? Who's like, yeah, there's just a baby, like, two years old walking down the hallway, but not my problem. (laughs) Can we we take a break Let's take a short break. Okay, we're going to take a break, and uh, we'll be back with more with... Jen Grant. Ooh, I kind of like that. This episode, episode number eight, is brought to you once again by HP Audio, Toronto listeners. Sorry to isolate you listeners, but uh, local sponsor, Toronto. You're looking for DJ services for your event? Whatever the event, your wedding, your party, private event, business luncheon. We love our luncheons in Toronto. Look no further. HP Audio can do that for you. Elaborate audio installs. Do that too. Email djhpaudio at gmail.com. That's djhpaudio at gmail.com. Enter JDCH in the subject line for special offers. Do it today. Okay, we're back with Jen Grant. Jen was in Egypt and Israel. We were just talking about that. I also was just in the bathroom. Also just in the bathroom. She with uh, she got kicked by a camel, threw up, found a baby, and now she's back. <laughs> okay, so you do the tour. Mm-hmm. You met some uh, friends that you've made for life. Mm-hmm. It's great. You come back to Vancouver. You spend how long in Vancouver? Uh, I spent four years in total in Vancouver. Four years. So you're eight years in the stand-up. Yeah. And then you decide to make the move... To the big city of New York. Yes. How does that come about? Well, um, before I decided to do it, I was doing these things in the States already because I, I, you know, I was really ambitious about stand up and I wanted, I always envisioned myself living in the States and doing stand up and then probably also being like a comedic actress of some kind. That's what I always envisioned. So Mm -hmm. I would take. I would get these opportunities. So while I'm in Vancouver, I did the Seattle comedy competition a couple times. Mm -hmm. And which is a three week comedy con. Is it the three week? It is. If you make it past the semis, which I didn't Right. actually, I'm sorry if you make it past the prelims and I didn't. So there's preliminary semifinals and then finals. And I didn't, uh, both times I never got past the preliminaries, but, uh, but, one really good thing happened from that is that I got just for laughs from that. That was a big thing. That So the, the puppetry of the penis, the military show tour, going to Egypt and Israel, and then doing um, Seattle, which resulted in just for laughs homegrown, was like, it was just like, Vancouver was such a perfect move for me because as I did it, everything was just falling into place. Yeah, a lot of good things happened to you. You also got your comedy now or when you were over there, right? Yes, that took a lot longer though. That's a whole other story. I showcased for that a lot of times and didn't get it. Mm-hmm. In fact, one night I showcased with three other comedians. It was only us on the show. There was four of us showcasing for comedy now. All the other comedians <laughs> got it except for me. How do you... It was Lachlan Patterson, Erica Sigurdsson, and Toby Hargrave, and myself, and everybody else got a comedy now that night except for me. Like, if I was the guy choosing, I would have just been like, ah, let's give it to all of them. They'll be fine. How do you bounce back from that? How do you not take that personally? Oh, it was a nightmare. You, so you did take it personally. Of course. I can't not. It's I'm too sensitive. I'm, I'm surprised I'm even in this business. So when it happened, I was so distraught like my whole life was stand up I was obsessed and so everybody else and I played by the rules I thought I did a really good showcase and then I didn't get it and everybody else got it so the next year when he came around to showcase I was all like I couldn't I that's the other thing about me is I wear my heart on my sleeve everybody knows how I feel I can't hide Mm -hmm. it so he shows up and he's like hey Jen I'm like hey 
Like I almost wasn't even going to audition because I'm like, screw you. You don't want me. I'm not going to do it. You know, got my nose out of joint. So then he was like, he's like, you know, I shouldn't say this, but I really want to give you a comedy now this year. And I was like, yeah, mm -hmm, whatever. Like I was such a bitch to him. And I always ended up getting it that year. And a comedy now is a half hour special or hour special. You can pick, eat, choose either or, depending on how much material you want to put out there, uh, that airs on our com- the Comedy Network, which is mm-hmm. uh, our answer to Comedy Central here in Canada. Uh, well, don't you find that such a beginner's mind, like you always think you're ready for things. Maybe you weren't ready. To, looking back, don't you? aren't you glad you didn't get it that first year? Like, don't you find that things just sort of happen in due time? Because there's, there's a saying in this business, and, or in any like um, field in show business, sort of, or creative endeavors, you can always do two things too soon, but you can never do them too late because you'll always just be more ready, more polished, Aren't you glad now, looking back, that you didn't get it that first time? Of course, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, that's the, you know, there's good and bad things about being a beginner. You know, it's like beginners, there's that saying, you know, beginners see many possibilities, experts see few. So there's really great things about being a beginner. The other the other um, difficulty about being a beginner, for me, and I think it's very common in comedians, is that you start out thinking, People tell you it takes you 10 years to be a good comic, but in the mm-hmm. back of your mind, you're thinking, well, probably not me, though. Everybody thinks that. Yeah. I'll be faster. I'll be faster. I'm, I'm amazing. Yeah. And so, um, no, you're right, and it, it wasn't my best interest, but I'm stubborn, and, you know, when you're ambitious, like, you get hurt, and it's, you're too obsessed, and you, I, I'm just, I, you know, you feel like you're doing everything right, and then you don't get it. Mm-hmm. And, and, I mean, that was especially... That especially stung because there was three other people that got it and I didn't. Right. And, and they're so your friends and you're doing this together and then you're the only one. You have to face them and you think of what... Yeah. And I always felt like I was the Ottawa comic trying to prove myself in Vancouver. I really did. I really did. I never felt like... I always felt like I was just trying to catch up all the time and then all these Vancouver comics get it except for the Ottawa comic. I just... Mm-hmm. I Oh, it was really hard. Anyway, so... I did the so the leading to the New York thing. So I, a lot of, a lot of things happened in Vancouver. Just for laughs, puppetry of the penis, of Egypt and Israel, comedy now eventually, uh, which you had had by the time you moved to New York. So and you had done Seattle, so you were doing some work Boston. in the Northwest, Boston, which you were the first Canadian, first woman and first Canadian to ever make the finals in that prestigious comedy contest. You came in third. Yep. And uh, so you do all these things. And the thing about performing in these contests in the States is that you meet all these comedians. You sort of power bond with them. It's an intense experience. You're all going through this together. So when you move to New York, first of all, what, what, why New York? Well, because um, I was on the West Coast in Vancouver and I thought, I kind of felt like I needed another change. A and then B, I always saw myself settling and ending up in LA. So I thought, well, if I'll end up living in LA, because I do love the West Coast, but I just felt like I just needed to see what New York was like. New York was, um, I knew that if I had put it off too long, I'd never do New York because mm-hmm. New York was so intense. And it's the kind of place that I always wondered what it would be like to live there. And when I had visited, I was really uh, intrigued by the energy. It was very quick and fast paced in the pulse and just the potential for the opportunities. I always liked Saturday Night Live. I loved the idea of it. So I thought, well, I'm going to get this uh, O-1 work visa and I'm going to go to New York. O-1 work visa is especially challenging to get because you have to prove that you're in an elite category in your own country. It's a performing visa. And so, but you, because of all these opportunities that you got by moving to Vancouver, you were able to get that no problem mm-hmm. and you pay well not no problem it was yeah. it was pretty hard but you get a lawyer it's like six thousand dollars the lawyer helps a lot mm-hmm. yeah it cost me six thousand dollars and yeah i got a three-year visa uh makes going through the border a lot easier i'll tell you that and did much. you know anybody in new york yeah i knew um i knew i had a couple friends uh not very many though and um i bumped into Stacia Jensen, who was uh, a girl I had met 
at the Seattle Comedy Competition, and she was a comic, and we ended up being roommates. And then I had heard through the grapevine that Christine Von Hagen was going to be moving to, to New York, and I had never really met her. I think we met briefly. I didn't know her at all, which is really strange because, you know, it's a pretty small industry, but we never hung out. And then we ended up being roommates. I contacted her on Facebook and we connected that way and we ended up having a lot of fun mm-hmm. as roommates. How long were you there for? I was there for three years. I love how and Julian's compare- at, Julian lived with me there. Well, yeah, but I want to interview you like, you know, a, lo- a lot of people won't know this that are listening. So, you know, okay, we'll edit this part out. Um, So you're living there. <laughs> What did you find a difference in the audiences between between Canada and New York? Um, yes, like it, Long Island was a place that I ended up getting a lot of stage time, and um, they were really hard audiences, like really governor. Hard. Uh, which co- like Governor's Comedy yeah. Club? Yeah, which and has been made famous by the documentary comedian um, Jerry Seinfeld is performing in there. Mm-hmm. and uh he's he's getting heckled yeah this is after his sitcom success and everything yeah and so that's the club that was sort of your home club there right yeah pretty much i mean it was the one place that i could consistently get um stage time at mm-hmm. and talk about the audiences oh my goodness so i mean by the time i moved to new york i've been doing stand-up i guess nine years And so I was really experienced and I'd already done a bunch of things. And obviously I had material that was consistent enough that I would be willing to do it on that stage. I was felt confident to do it, but I pretty much bombed like the first eight times I got up on that stage and I was, I felt like I was being punked. And that's a big like room. It's a like, it's a big club. It's probably about 400 people sitting there. Mm Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was mysterious. I was like, I don't understand why this is happening. Like I would get up and I would like completely bomb. And, uh, and I, I thought I was being punked cause I'm like, these jokes always work. Why aren't they working? Mm-hmm. So I do. What punch- do you think it was? Well, I, I think it was attitude right. that they're very much Americans in general compared to Canadian comics are more like out there with their attitude like you have no they question sell how they the feel. shit out of their yeah. material and so at one point i did a punchline that always works and i got nothing and i looked down at this woman who's very long island she had all these like these crazy nails and like huge bangs and she was she had her arms folded i looked down and i go nothing on that really nothing and she just nodded her head and was like Nuh-uh. and i was like Fuck. so then the next time i went on stage i was better it was like sometimes i find with stand-up you just have to it just all settles i don't no. know something happens where you just figure out the room and you don't really know what happened but you just get better at mm-hmm. and I, I think it was that i needed more confidence too and maybe it just i needed to go through that to to be like fuck you i don't care Mm-hmm. attitude and then it just came I, I had to bomb eight times for me to go well this isn't working so i guess i'll try some more confidence and new york is one of those places where i talked about this with graham k who was on the podcast where you can just randomly all of a sudden work with the best comedians in the world and c- comedians you've looked up to your whole life have you had any experiences with with great comics like that? Have you rubbed shoulders with some of the best in the world? Yes. Um, at Governor's, I was able to work with Robert Klein, mm-hmm. which is crazy. Yeah. And um, that was a crazy story, too. He, When I introduced him, I was it was just him and I on the show. I did 20 minutes, and he was doing his whatever he wanted to do, which was like an hour. Mm-hmm. He's like 70-some now. And um, when I introduced him... He came on stage, he grabbed me, put me against the wall and pretended to make out with me. I was like, <laughs> whoa, okay. So then I'm in the green room while he's on stage and the booker comes back and says, you're going to have to do some time after Robert Klein's done. And I said, haha, very funny. And he's like, no, you're going to have to do like 20 minutes after he's done. I said, there's no way. 
that is a nice a nightmare in the best case scenario when you're like because okay in the best setting that's a nightmare when it's like let's say it's just a regular show maybe it's uh, you know a home crowd or something where you'd have to do material after as the MC after the headliner still a nightmare but this is you're on Long Island first of all yeah. hard tough club Robert Klein comedy legend just did a headliner and he, he does a big closer right mm-hmm. like a musical closer so he does a he has a piano player with him and so stuff. a piano player musical closer people are on their feet basically and you asked him to do uh, an encore. Well, so the booker was like, uh, you know, we're short staffed. The computer's broken. We can't get the bills out. And so we can't have, we can't have the show end. The show has to keep going. And I was like, yeah, but I don't even remember what I did. Like I did 20 minutes. Now I have to do 20 more. I don't even remember the jokes I did. And I have to follow Robert Klein. And like the, the audience was average age 65 for sure. Everybody, everybody was like that. It was a very special demographic. So he's like, well, the only thing that you can hope for maybe is ask him if he wants to do an encore. So I was clinging to this hope, like maybe he'll want to, he comes off stage, he's all sweaty, he's coming off. I go, hey, do you want to do an encore? And he's like, no, I'm done. I go, yeah, but if you, if you don't do that, then I have to follow you now. And he's like, yeah, I'm done. I was (laughs) like, fuck. So then I had to go on stage and start doing yay remember when you thought i was done here's some yeah. more material while they're wondering where their bills are everybody's m- talking to each other and there was a like this one couple couple little old ladies looking at me like go ahead dear we're here for you mm-hmm. like all supportive and was that all uh, right no it wasn't great but it, i'm surprised i'm surprised that i did that okay so Okay, we have to wrap up here soon, but just quick, I don't want to blast through too fast of your New York years. You were there for three years. Just quick, a couple highlights, maybe people you worked with. Um, okay. Oh, go ahead. No, that's it. Okay, so at that club, I worked with, um, that's where I got to work with a lot of people. I work, And I also worked at Rodney Dangerfield's club called Dangerfields. And um, I didn't work w- with like famous people there, but the place is really unique and interesting to be there because it kind of feels like it's a time warp. You're going back in time. You walk in and it's the same carpet and walls and lamps and tables. Waiter. And, uh, waiter from the 70s. or It's like crazy. It is it is a time warp. You're in the middle of the city and all of a sudden you're going back 30 years. Mm-hmm. And... Um, at Governor's, uh, I also worked with Jim Brewer, which was really cool. Um, and then I worked with uh, Louis C.K., which is great. We, uh, I opened for him. He worked one night. He was working on new material. So I got to do 20 minutes before him and hang out with him in the green room and really watch him and watch him work and see him with his cue cards and his, uh, his laptop. And, you know, he's so prolific. It's great to see someone like that at work you Mm -hmm. know 25 years into the business or well at that point probably a little bit more Mm -hmm. and now i guess 30 years in in the business so like that's double what i've 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 been in so like to watch somebody that much of a master at what he does it's pretty it was pretty amazing especially in a setting like a club and was it pretty amazing to watch it was awesome to watch i watched every second of his act on both shows Mm -hmm. yeah did he watch any of yours you know um i would suspect he may have watched a little bit of it but People talk, I noticed people were talking his ear off, which was really annoying. And I'm, In I, the green room? You yeah, mean? I purposely didn't. I purposely sat quietly by myself because I thought, you know, he probably gets annoyed all the time. Mm-hmm. And he's not there just to for the shits, shits and giggles. He's like working on stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I can, I saw him working hard and trying to focus. And so people chat his ear off and I could tell he was getting annoyed with these other comics that were talking to him and then. Uh, and so I let him come to me and he, he did talk to me and he was, he was very nice. I don't know if he really watched me, but, um, I don't, I'm not sure if he would have watched me. I know, like, I like it when I worked with Greg Fitzsimmons and he, he offered me a couple good tags that I use to this day in my act. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that. I think he's, I think he's really funny. And yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, and then, uh, so three years in New York, 
so uh, we sort of blasted through that, but we could talk about it again. I'll definitely have you on again. Um, so thank you for doing it. You're welcome. We went a little long, but uh, we could do a two-parter. I'll have you definitely again because I feel like uh, for the New York portion, there's a lot we can get into there about how, you know, New York is an energy and vibe and it's sort of like you either love it or hate it. And I feel like towards the end, you may didn't, may not have liked it as much and you feel like you may have uh, burned out a little bit. Mm-hmm. But uh, we'll get into that another time. I know okay. I'm sort of, te- I'm teasing for the next episode for part two with Jen Grant uh, in a little bit, maybe in three weeks, maybe in six months, but it's going to happen. And... Um, before, you're so serious right now. <laughs> uh, before you go, do you want to do a th- the thing? Yeah, okay. definitely. It's time now for another installment of Are You Mariah or Yoko? And now, Julian Dion presents Are You Mariah or Yoko? Where we find out from each of your celebrity guests, is it vocal range or Vocal strain. Okay, we are back here uh, with Jen Grant, of course. Now, Jen is uh, usually does the segment "Are You Mariah or Yoko?" with my guest, and uh, this week my guest is Jen Grant. So, how are we going to do this? Well, I will compete mm-hmm. against Jen Grant. So this it'll is be, awesome. It'll be me and you. Once again, the guest chooses the song. Oh, I guess you should choose. Well, do you want me to? No, we, I don't mind. Right. That's fine. We'll do this one? Yeah. Okay, I chose a song. We we choose from uh, the top 100 songs of all time. And the one we went with is um, Stevie Wonder, Superstition. Okay. And uh, Jen, just explain uh, a little bit quickly the segment for f- maybe first-time listeners Okay, so, you know, when you're listening to your music and you have your earbuds in and it's on really loud and you sing along to it by yourself, you think you sound awesome, but what you're hearing is really them singing, so you can't hear yourself to know that you don't sound the best. Well, I'm putting this to the test right now, and we're going to see who who can sing the best under those circumstances and who ends up sounding like Mariah and who ends up being more of a Yoko. Okay, so, so we can't just, hear uh, ourselves when we're singing. Let me just pull up the lyrics here. Don't forget, enthusiasm okay. counts for stuff, too. Enthusiasm counts, okay. All right, here we go. Oh, my God, I'm so excited to hear you. <laughs> and again, I can't hear anything, but uh, I can't hear my I'll voice. I can just hear the music. And uh, here we go. Superstition by Stevie Wonder. This is a good song. It's really good. Hold on. Superstitious. <laughs> Writings on the wall. Very superstitious. Is it too loud? <laughs> loud is about to fall. This is so good. My soul, baby. Broke the looking glass. <laughs> Seven years of bad luck. When you believe in the things you, that you don't understand, then you suffer. Ha! Session at the way. I'm not going to lead the audience in believing okay. anything. I'm going to let them decide and they email the answer to it. Cause I, okay. Kinda wanna but I actually, again. you started really good. Uh, okay, here we go. Jen Grant, submission now, Stevie <sighs> Wonder, superstition. Okay. Here you go. Such a good sound. Be superstitious. Writings on the wall. Very superstitious. Ladders about to fall. Thirteen month old baby. Broke the looking glass. 
Seven years of bad luck. When you believe in things that you don't understand, you suffer. Ah, superstition ain't the way. <laughs> All right. There we go. Jen Grant, <laughs> Stevie Wonder Superstition. Now, usually I would decide the winner uh, of the contest because it's my show. But we're going to leave it up to you because we both um, we both sung our hearts out. So you get to decide who's Mariah or Yoko. Uh, so email the show pod at, uh, that's pod, P-O-D, at jdcomedyhour.com. And uh, just let us know who is Mariah, who is Yoko. So once again, that was an interactive version of Are You Mariah or Yoko? Okay, Jen. Well, thanks for doing it. And um, thanks a lot for uh, your stories. Thank you very much for having me. And sharing your life. No problem. It was fun. And Thank you uh, so much. Yeah. And I'll see you. I can't you, wait uh, to see who they think is the winner of the Yoko. Well, I was laughing a lot during mine, but uh, <laughs> don't let that it's deter you. It's hard not to laugh. I know. That was my first time doing it. Anyway, uh, thanks for doing it. I will will have you again to get into uh, the New York side of things. Anyway. Oh, thank you very thanks. much. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> have a good day. Have you have a good you day take, as well. You take care now. Now you take care. No, okay, you watch Keep your head. Chat. Keep in okay. chat. And watch your head. Well, there we go, folks. Episode number eight. There, Put that in the record books. Eight episodes deep. Thanks again for listening. Thanks to my guest, Jen Grant. Thanks a million times to you for listening time and time again. Be sure to uh, cast your vote for the Mariah or Yoko. Remember, it was my first time doing it. It's a go easy on me. So email the show pod, P-O-D, at jdcomedyhour.com. Let us know who was Mariah and who was Yoko between Jen and I, or if they're both Yoko, both Mariah. Thanks to my producer, Adam Fox. Thanks to my sound engineer, Miles Lacroix. Check out the show on Facebook, facebook.com slash JD Comedy Hour. Follow on Instagram and Twitter at JD Comedy Hour. What else? That's it. Thanks. Oh, and rate the show on iTunes. If you can, do me that one solid. I appreciate it. And just drop me a line. I want to hear from you. Well, read your emails on air. All right. What else? Hope I'm not forgetting. Am I forgetting someone? Am I? I can't think. Thanks for listening. Mom, I love you. And watch your head. I'm just a thin, nervous shadow. Walking backwards down a 